All right, we've been, actually, we haven't been anything because I've been on vacation. <laughs> but we're in the book of Amos, and uh, we started it a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we are in Amos chapter 1. And let's pray before we get started. Father, uh, we come before you uh, again, Lord, with our Bibles open and just ready to hear from you and to hear from your word. Lord, we thank you uh, that um, you're a God, again, who knows the end from the beginning. And Lord, when you speak to um, us uh, in many, uh, at many times and in, in many uh, places, um, you did it through prophets. And you had faithful men and faithful women who would just listen to you and do exactly what you asked them to. And Father Amos is one of those guys. And Lord, we, we pray that as we're going through and looking at the words that you gave to this man, uh, Father, that they would just touch our hearts and that they would change our minds and help us to walk in a way that you've called us to. And we just pray that, ble that you bless the study of your word now. And we ask that you do it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Did you win? You won. Very good. Okay, uh, Book of Amos. Um, we are, uh, again, in chapter 1. We basically got down to um, verse 9. But I'm going to go through and um, basically read the whole chapter. Not basically, I'm just going to <laughs> read the whole chapter just to give you the context. Verse 1, it says, The words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, uh, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron. But I will send a fire into the house of Hazael, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. I will also break the gate, of, uh, gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter from Beth Eden. The people of Syria shall go captive to Kir, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four. I will not turn away its punishment because they took captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. But I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, which shall devour its palaces. I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon, I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. But I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre, which shall devour its palaces. And cast off all pity, his anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Basra. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the people of Ammon and for four. I will not turn away its punishment, because they ripped open the women with child in Gilead, that they might enlarge their ter territory. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour its palaces, and shouting in the day of battle, and a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. Their king shall go into captivity, he and his princes together, says the Lord." Now this um, prophecy um, was written about 755 um, BC, and you'll rem remember that um, the Northern Kingdom of Israel went into captivity in 722. So we're 33 years before the captivity of the Northern Kingdom. That's when the Assyrians came in and, and took out the 10 tribes of Israel that were in the North, right? And so we're about a generation before that takes place. And one of the things that we see in this book, as, uh, as well as uh, what we saw in the book of Joel, is that God comes to these people before the fact and lets them know that judgment is coming. The reason that he did it so soon, or ex excuse me, so far ahead of the judgment, is because he's giving these people time to repent. That's what he's looking to do. Now, um, one of the, uh, again, one of the things that you see when you're going through the minor prophets um, specifically, is that a lot of these books have to do with judgment, and especially the earlier ones. Um, they're going to have to do with the judgment of Israel, the northern kingdom. They're going to have to do with the judgment of Judah, the southern kingdom. And so it's going to be a theme as we're going through. And um, one of the things that I like to tell people when we're going through books like this is to keep in mind 
that when, when God is pouring out judgment on a group of people, the reason that he's doing it is because they for a long time have refused to turn. That's why he's doing it, okay? And so I always keep in mind that when I'm going through my Bible, not every single verse is for my situation. Not every single verse is about me. And um, uh, that's what I want to um, uh, point out to you guys because it's going to, you know, we're going to be talking about judgment. And a lot of people who are really tender hearted sit there and when they hear a Bible study like this, they go, I wonder if God's going to judge me because I've done some wrong things. And um, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that there are people who are hard hearted and will not turn. Those are the people who get the judgment. That's, that's why it's happening. And so um, many times what, what I see with people who are going through the Bible is you got these tender hearted people who want to do what God says and they are um, soft hearted towards God in the sense that they recognize that they're sinners and, and that kind of stuff. And a lot of times they take verses that are not for them and they apply them to themselves. And I'm not saying that some of these verses may not be for you. Um, so for example, if you've been doing stuff that is displeasing to God and you're refusing to turn, then you can absolutely take these verses for yourself and they are yours, right? But if you're, if you're someone who's following the Lord and you're doing your best to do the things that he wants you to, then not every verse on judgment is about you. So just keep that in mind. The other thing that you, you see is the grace of God. So over 30 years before the judgments are going to come down, God sent a number of prophets to these guys to try to get them to turn so that the judgment doesn't have to happen. And um, one of the things that you run into when you, again, look at these prophecies is it looks like they're going to happen no matter what. And so sometimes people, when they're going through the Old Testament prophets, they look at what God has to say and they go, well, you know, God told him he's going to judge him and he didn't really give them a, a, a way out. And so obviously he was just going to judge them and they didn't have an opportunity, they didn't have a chance. And for people who say that to me, I always refer them to the book of Jonah. And in the book of Jonah, Jonah is told to go to the people of Nineveh who were rotten people. They were rotten people. Um, when they would capture, when they, when they would fight against a country and they, were, they would capture a village, they would literally go through and cut the heads off every man and many times before they cut the heads off these guys, they would cut their arms off and make bets on how long they would live. These were rotten people. And so they deserved the judgment of God. It's one of the reasons that Jonah didn't want to go there. And so God um, convinces Jonah that maybe he should go, right? And you know that whole story. Um, and uh, Jonah ends up in Nineveh and he walks through the city and what does he say? And he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 days you're toast. 40 days, you're dead. God's going to kill you. And that's, mo that's, that's Jonah's great preaching message. And what happens <laughs> is the king and everybody in the town decide that, you know, maybe they should take a chance on the God of Israel. And maybe if they would repent, then God wouldn't judge them. And so you have the passage where it talks about the, the king of Nineveh who uh, goes through and he commands everybody to repent and put sackcloth and ashes uh, on. And that was a symbol of mourning for sin. And he says, yeah, I want you to even do it with a cattle. And so all the cows have sackcloth and ashes on them and stuff. And so they repent. And Jonah, meanwhile, has been sitting outside the city waiting for the fire of God to come down and wipe these people out. And when it didn't happen, he's all mad about the whole thing. And he goes, I knew you were going to do this, God. Jonah knew God. That's why he didn't want to go. He knew that God um, is gracious and kind and he doesn't want to judge anybody. And so he was giving them a, an opportunity. But it doesn't look like an opportunity. It looks like just a statement of judgment and it's coming down on you. And what I'm saying to you is that even though we see some of this in these passages, um, every time that God speaks to a person, there is an opportunity for them to stop and for them to turn around and for them to do the right thing and get things straight with God and get things straight with the people around them. And so don't ever get a, um, uh, an attitude where you're just fatalistic about what God's gonna do. Now, did Israel repent? Nope, they did not. But he gave them a generation to repent, 33 years. It's more than a generation. Generation's about 20 years. 
And so he gave them a generation to repent and they just didn't do it. And so it's not God's deal um, in, in the sense that God didn't give them a, an opportunity. And so every time that I go through these books, I keep that in mind. He's gone through and he's um, talking to a group of cities. He doesn't start off with uh, Judah and Israel. He's going to end up with them. And, um, but he goes through and he begins talking to a group of cities that have violated the covenant that they had with God. And you might be thinking, what covenant did Damascus have with God? And what covenant did Gaza, that's the Philistines, what covenant did they have with God? And one of the things that you see with God is that um, he holds people to account for the things that they know. He doesn't hold them to account for the things that they don't know. When he deals with the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah, he's going to bring in the Old Testament covenant, the law. And he's going to begin speaking of that. But when he talks to these nations, when he talks to these city-states, he is referring to a covenant that God made with Noah. And everybody is under that covenant, whether you're talking about Jew or Gentile, everybody's under the covenant with Noah because we all got off the same boat, basically. And that covenant with Noah was from God's, on God's side, that he was not going to flood the earth again, and so he set his rainbow in the clouds. And on man's side, what God commanded was, if man sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. And what he's doing is he's stopping murder. And he's commanding that the people on the earth, specifically the governments of the earth, stop murder. And there's a reason for that, because before the flood, you had everybody who, uh, the Bible says that their thoughts were just evil continually. And um, specifically, murder um, in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 5, is flaunted in the face of God by one of Cain's descendants. And obviously, that would be something that, that went on there. Uh, again, the Bible says that their hearts were evil continually. You have a commentary on that by Jesus also in Matthew 24. So you have these people murdering each other before the flood, and God goes, that's going to stop. Man's made in the image of God, and you will not shed his blood. If you shed man's blood by man, your blood will be shed, whether it's by an animal or whether it's by a man. So an animal that kills a man because a man is made in the image of God is to be put to death. A man who kills a man, and we're talking about murder. Um, we're not talking about warfare, and we're not talking about um, executions. We're not talking about self-defense. The word, uh, we talked about this on Sunday morning. Um, when the Bible says thou shalt not kill, it's literally thou shalt not do murder. And the word that's used there for killing is a word that's never used of um, slaughtering animals, it's never used of executions, and it's never used of warfare. It's only used for murder. And so it's a word that literally means murder. And so um, when you look at the judgments that God brings down on these guys, and we've already done it, so I'm not going to go back through it, but when he talks to the people of Damascus, he is judging them uh, because the, the governing body of Damascus, the people of Damascus, had come down and literally tortured to death the people of Israel. They murdered them. So there's warfare, and then there's murder. And what they did with the captives that they took was, it says that they um, threshed Gilead with implements of iron. And we talked about a threshing um, implement last time. It's uh, something that was made, basically it was uh, made of uh, rough shaped boards. Uh, they were bent upward at the front and then studded with, studded with iron prongs or knives. And it looks like, like what they did was they took the captives and just ran this over the top of them. They murdered them. And God saw what Damascus did to Gilead, and God said, I'm taking you out. And in every one of these judgments that, that you have here, you have God um, talking to these people, to the city-states, as if he's the king, and they're a vassal, and this is what I'm going to do with my army, to your city. And so with Damascus, he says, I'm gonna break, break the bar of your gate, and I'm going to come in, and I'm gonna destroy you. And he does the same thing with Gaza. Um, he says, verse seven, I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, which shall devour its palaces, and I'll cut, cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod, and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. And that's a picture of um, besieging a city 
and then taking it. And that's what God says he's going to do to these guys. The third group um, was Tyre, and that's the last one that we got to last time. And one of the things that, that you'll see as we're going through these judgments that God is pouring out on these um, countries and also on the people of Israel is that he goes from furthest to closest. And what I mean by that is he goes to, um, he goes to nations that are distant in the sense of uh, relation and even distant in the sense of miles from the people of Israel. And then he gets closer and closer as far as relation goes. And so he starts off with Damascus, which was distant from, uh, from uh, Judah, and um, it was further north than uh, the kingdom of Israel. Then he goes to Gaza, which is right smack in the middle of Israel. And then he goes to Tyre, and um, Tyre is, as far as distance goes, it's comparable to Damascus, but as far as relation goes, the city of Tyre was related to the people of Israel. And we talked about this again last time. There was a covenant between David and Solomon and the people of Tyre. And that covenant was a, a covenant of friendship. And basically what these guys did was they defiled that covenant of friendship that they had with the people of Israel. And instead of honoring that, what they did was when Israel was in bad straits, they literally took the, the uh, people, they made raids on the people of Israel and they sold them into slavery to the people of Edom. And God's gonna get to Edom here in just a minute also. In any case, um, the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 16, 20, um, 20, uh, 1620 through 22, um, God, speaking of Israel as people, he says, when they went from one nation to another and from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no man to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. And that passage is speaking about the community, the, the whole group of the people of Israel. He considered them to be his prophets and he considered them to be his anointed ones. And he demanded that the people who are around them do them no harm. In Genesis 12:3, uh, this was uh, pointed to Abraham. And God says in that passage, this is familiar, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so God makes a promise that if you go after his people, that what he's going to do is he's going to curse you. If you bless his people, he's going to bless you. If you curse his people, he's going to curse you. You know why I think the judgment of God hasn't fallen on uh, the nation of the United States for the last 60 years? Because politically, we have been the nation that blesses the land of Israel. And I think that's why. And I think it's the only reason why. Because we, you know, as far as the, as far as the nation goes, we've got, done all kinds of things that are just vile in the sight of God. And so when you're talking about murder, and again, we talked about this on Sunday morning, it's like, it's like people, you know, we, we think that we're a moral people. We, you know, 50 million children have been sacrificed in abortion clinics. 50 million since the 1970s, since 1973, 50 million. That's a crazy number. I was just, uh, did you guys see that, that video? Of the, of the abortion clinic lady. You know, she's a, a, you know, a mucky muck in uh, Planned Parenthood. And she was talking about using aborted uh, babies for um, uh, organs. And the way that they would make sure that they wouldn't crush the, the torso so they could get the, get the liver out. And she said things like, yeah, people really want livers. You know, and, and it's like, you're a stinking ghoul, lady. What is wrong with people? I can't, you know, it's just amazing to me that people can get, get so far gone that they can, they can sit there. And this lady, you know, I, I watched this video. She's sitting there eating a salad at lunch, talking about this stuff. And, you know, talking about it like, I don't know. Like she's talking about a conversation she had with a girlfriend or something. And she's talking literally about crushing babies' heads and, you know, um, uh, you know, if they, want, if they want legs, those are easy to get. And just craziness, just crazy. And God sees all that. And the Bible says that blood defiles the land. And every single one of those babies, 50 million of them, have been made in the image of God. And so you start looking at the, at the things that the United States has, has been doing as far as 
turning away from God, and we, you know, that we have the whole situation where in our culture people um, are getting more and more rabidly anti-God, anti-Bible, and willing to open up their mouths and, and just shout Christians down and, and that kind of stuff. God sees all that. We force them out of the public square. We force them out of the school. We force them out of every place that we can try to force God out of. And guess what? God's not going. Anyway, we try to force them out of, and you know, obviously I'm not talking about us, but we try to force them out of all these different places, and then we start getting the consequences of those things, and I would just submit to you that the consequences haven't been that bad yet, but, they're, but it's coming. And then you have this whole thing, again, with murder and, and um, all, of, all of that kind of stuff, and you, you cannot um, do those things in the sight of God and expect that you're not going to be judged for it because God watches every single one of those events. He watches them pull babies' bodies apart. apart. And um, there's going to be a judgment that comes from that. When you get to the, to the next group of people here, and again, the, the reason I think that we haven't been judged yet is because we've been politically on Israel's side, but not so much anymore, huh? And so now we've, now we've got a situation where um, there's a good chance that when, when you're talking about political divides, it's probably getting upwards of half the people in this nation don't want to protect Israel. I'll bet you. I'll bet you they start doing a poll, you know, because people vote, vote in blocks. And so you have a whole voting block that thinks that you should be able to pull a baby apart anytime that you want to. And you have a whole voting block that thinks that I should be able to take your money from you and give it to me. And the government should do that. And that should be okay. And I shouldn't have to work. And that kind of stuff. You have a whole block of people that vote that way. And, you know, when you, when you start talking about some of, the, some of the moral issues that we have going on in the country, um, it's just wild to me that you got a 50-50 split. That's craziness to me. I can't, I don't understand how people can think that way, but, you know, that's what the Bible says is going to be happening. It says, that's what the Bible says, that's the place that we're going to be going, and um, lo and behold, that's exactly what's happening. Um, you curse those who God has blessed, and you are going to be cursed. And that is, you know, I... I Here's another thing that we need to keep in mind about God. You know, I love the Lord. He is so gracious to me. And I know that he's gracious to you too. But there is a limit. There are things that God will not put up with. And I've always known that about him. You know, when I, when I first started walking with the Lord, uh, I, would, I would step out. I, you know, I've, I've always been the guy that gets smacked with a two by four. And I step out of line and God makes it really clear that I'm out of line. And so what I do is I step right back in line and I do whatever needs to get done to get right back in line. And so if it takes an apology, I'll give an apology. If it takes, you know, turning my life around, I'll turn my life around because I want to follow Jesus and I don't want to be like I was in the world. And it's just, it's a real simple thing. And for, for the most part, um, you know, again, I, when I think of my relationship with God, I just, I just think of him as, as somebody who's absolutely gracious to me, everything that I have, everything that I have are things that I don't deserve. And I know that, right? And so absolutely gracious. But I'm not going to mess with the guy because he's absolutely righteous too. And he doesn't put up with junk. And so it's, it's one of those, those reasons we're going to uh, be doing a thing on purity on, on Sunday night and, you know, a lot of times when you, when you think about purity, you know, people think about, okay, we're going to talk about, you know, pornography and, and stuff like that and how to get out of that. And, yeah, that's a, that's a part of it. But you know what purity is? Being able to go to bed at night and know that you're right with God. And as much as you can be, you're right with people around you. That's what purity is. I know that if I stand before Jesus right now, as far as I know, I don't have, I don't have a list. Things are taken care of between me and him. Now, that doesn't mean that everything's taken care of because I don't know everything that I've done. You know, there may be things I have no clue about. 
And so I don't, I don't think that I'm perfect in any way. But when, when there are things that are wrong between me and the Lord, I go take care of them because I don't want to be alone. Are you like that? You know, and that's, and that's, the, that's the kind of life that we're supposed to be living as Christians. And so, you know, gosh, man, this, this, whole, this whole thing where we're, we're, we're seeing the junk that goes on ar- around us and, and even some of the political situations, it's like you don't mess with God the way that this country is messing with God, especially with the, with the responsibility and the accountability that we have. And, you know, I don't know. The Bible says judgment begins at the house of God. And it's something that we need to keep in mind. I think that God's going to judge the United States and I think he's going to start with a church. And I think that he does that you know, kind of routinely. He goes through and cleans house, lets you know who people are and that kind of stuff because he wants a pure church. We need to be people who actually love Jesus and want to go for it. And you, know, you guys know that I don't mean that you need to be perfect, right? You just got to be in love with Jesus and want to go for it. And when you mess up, you mess up, you make it right or do your best to make it right and then you move on. Righteous man falls seven times and then rises up again is what scripture says. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. And we got, we got a situation where judgment should be coming and it hasn't for a long time. And I think it's coming because we're not blessing those that God wants to bless. Now that's talking about Israel. You got the same thing with the people of God because the same attitude that God's got towards Israel is the same attitude that he's got towards his people. You remember when uh, Paul the apostle gets knocked off his horse what Jesus says to him is, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul had never met Jesus. So how could he be persecuting him? And what was going on there was Jesus was taking the persecution of Saul, of Tarsus, against Christians personally. And he's, uh, basically what he's saying is, when you persecute them, you're persecuting me. When you throw them in jail, you're persecuting me. When you chase them down, you're, chasing, you're going after me. When you lie about them, you're going after me. He takes it personally. And what he says to Saul is that it's hard for you to kick against the goats. And he, basically what he just told him there was, you're not a sheep, you're a, you're a cattle, or you're a donkey, one of those two. And I'm sticking you with a stick, Bucky. And, it's, and you're kicking against the goads and stuff. And so, and then, you know, Saul repents and gives his life to Christ. But the, again, the point is that the same attitude that he's got, that God's got towards the people of Israel is the same attitude that he's got towards you. And he'll watch out for you and he'll protect you. So the next group that we've got in verse 11 is Edom. It says, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity. His anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. And what's he talking about there? And what he's talking about, Edom is actually the word for red in Hebrew. Did you know that? So Edom, Adam, um, those are words that mean red. There's a good chance that Adam was a red man because of his name, literally. And so Edom means red, and this is a group of people that came from a guy named Esau. You remember Esau was the brother of Jacob, and they were twins. He came out first, and Jacob came out holding on to his heel. He was a hairy man, and the Bible says Jacob was a smooth man. Okay, so he, he didn't have a lot of hair going on. Um, when Jacob and Esau grew up, Jacob went after Esau's birthright. And one of the things that he did was he basically um, used um, Esau's um, lust. What would you call it? It's not, it's not really lust. It's just his cravings. He used his flesh against him. And Esau came in from hunting one day, and Jacob was in the house or in the tent, and he's making a bowl of beans. And Jacob was kind of a mama's boy. And, and Esau was a daddy's boy. And uh, he's making a bowl of beans. And Esau comes in and says, give me some of your beans. And Jacob goes, well, I'll sell them to you. I'm not going to give them to you. I'll sell them to you. Give me your birthright. 
And Esau goes, what's this birthright going to do for me if I die? Do you know how long it takes you to starve to death? Like 60 days, depending on how, on how chubby you are. I'm probably up to 75 or 80. <laughs> you know? It takes you a long time to die of starvation. And so he's not going to die because he missed a meal. And basically what he does is he goes, I'm starving to death. I need food. And this birthright's doing me no good. The birthright was, was this whole spiritual thing where you're the head of the family and, and you're, you're like the spiritual head. You're like the priest of the family and stuff like that. And Jacob just goes, yeah, whatever. Give me some beans. And the beans were red. And so Esau, from, from, because of that story, was called red. You sold your birthright for a bowl of red, is literally what it says in the text. And so that nation was called Edom from that point on. And so Edom is the brother of Jacob. And you know that Jacob's name got changed to Israel. So literally, these two nations are brothers now. They're brothers. And you have one brother, um, Edom, who has this unrelenting hatred towards the people of Israel, toward, toward his brother Jacob, and it never stops. Earlier on, it talks about uh, the people of Tyre selling the people of Israel to the Edomites. They're literally selling them to their brothers. And the last Edomite that you have mentioned in the Bible is Herod, King Herod. It says that he was an Edomian, and it means an Edomite. And so historically what happens, happened was the Edomites got driven out of their land, which was across the Dead Sea on the um, uh, southeast side of the Dead Sea. And a, a bunch of Arabian tribes drove them out. They went down into southern Judah. And during the time of the Maccabeans, um, they became nominally Jewish. And Herod the Great and all the Herods after that, Herod Antipas and all those guys, were Edomians. They were Edomites. And so you have this unrelenting hatred of Edom towards Israel, and it's finally fulfilled in Herod the Great trying to kill off the Messiah. And then later on with his sons and his grandsons trying to kill off believers in Jesus. And so God looks at that and he goes, three transgressions of Edom and for four I will not turn away its punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword. And that's what he's talking about cast off all pity and his anger tore perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. And so God says that he's going to take out Edom because of this. Talks about two cities there. Teman was a major city in the south. Basra was a major city in the north. And basically what he's saying is the whole of Edom was going to be taken out. And that was fulfilled under the Assyrian conquest in the 700s BC. And then later on, like I said, the Nabataeans, which was an Arabian tribe, finally drove them out of the land in the 300s. And uh, then you have Herod. And you haven't heard of an Edomite since then. Any of you ever met an Edomite? Uh, one of the next books that we're going to read is the book of Obadiah. And the theme of Obadiah is Obad. And it's Obad for Edom. And God, in that book, says that I'm taking out Edom. And there's not going to be any, any turning away from that. And so you have that happen. Then you have Ammon. It says, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the people of Ammon and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they ripped open the women with child in Gilead that they might enlarge their territory. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah. And again, you have that whole picture of God coming up against a city and it shall devour its palaces amid shouting in the day of battle and a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. Their king shall go into captivity, he and his princes together says the Lord. Okay, now this is interesting because you have Ammon here and the next one is going to be Moab. And there's a passage in Genesis 19 that talks about where these guys came from. 1936 through 38 says, thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. And so again, you have this relation between the people of Israel and these nations that God's speaking about. You remember who Lot was? Abraham was told by God, I want you to leave your father and your family, and I want you to go to the place that, that I tell you. And so what did Abraham do? He stayed with his father and he took Lot. 
Okay, that's the first time that you see Abraham doing anything. He does get up and move and he packs it up, but he ends up hanging out with his dad and hanging out with Lot. And then his father dies. And after his father dies, then Abraham finally goes down into the land of Canaan. But guess who's hanging out with him? And it's his nephew Lot. His nephew Lot ends up going with him. And when he gets down in the land of Canaan, you have this whole, you have this whole conflict between Lot and Abraham. And Lot is a guy who is just fleshy. And, you know, he nominally followed the Lord in the sense that he acknowledged that, that God was who he was, that he was God. And he had this kind of nominal relationship with him in the, in the sense that it was a little bit distant. And so there was a point where his shepherds, you know, the, God's, God's blessing Abraham and he's blessing Lot because Lot's hanging with Abraham. That happens. God's blessing you and he'll bless your employer too. God's blessing you as an employer and he'll bless your employees too. You hang out with believers and the blessing that God brings down on them many times gets kind of scattered around to the people who are around them. That's what happened with Lot. And so Lot is having his flocks increase and now their shepherds are getting in fights over water and grazing rights and that kind of stuff. And so Abraham finally goes, this is ridiculous. This has got to stop. And so he goes, Lot, just pick a place that you want to go. And wherever you want to go, I'll turn around and go the opposite way. Now, God had already spoke to Abraham. You know what God gave Abraham? Everything. He gave him the whole deal. The whole land is yours. Not going to give it totally to you yet because there's some things that have to happen. But this whole land is yours. And Abraham was a guy who didn't hold on to the stuff that necessarily God had given him or blessed him with. And he was willing to let Lot go wherever he wanted to. And so you know where Lot ended up going? Sodom and Gomorrah. He looked down to the valley. And back at that time, apparently, you know, the, the valley that Sodom and Gomorrah was found in nowadays looks like the moon. There's, there, there's almost no vegetation at all. But back in that time, the Bible says that it was well watered down in the plain and it was, it was good for, for um, pasture land and that kind of stuff. And so basically what Lot does is he looks down there, he sees this nice place and he decides that he's gonna go that, that direction. And it's a great picture of, again, the lust of the eyes. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh and the pride of life. What happens is Lot looks towards Sodom, then he camps towards Sodom then he's living in Sodom, and then he's in the gate of Sodom. And what that means is, this is, this is how this goes, he's camping towards Sodom, it means he's hanging out around the city of Sodom. That valley is huge. He could have been anywhere he wanted to be, but he was hanging out by Sodom. And then what ends up happening is he moves into Sodom, and when he gets there, um, after he gets in, into the city of Sodom, when it says that he's sitting in the gate of Sodom, it means he's one of the rulers of Sodom. So not only is he involved with the people of Sodom, now he is in politics in the city of Sodom. And that's where he's at when the angel comes to take him and his family out. And his whole family doesn't even get out when God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he ends up in a, in a situation where he literally loses everything. And he goes out of that city. And as the conflagration is coming down on that city, fire from heaven is what it says. Fire and brimstone came down out of heaven. I don't know what all that means. I don't know how it happened. That is called the Great Rift Valley. It's volcanic. And so there's a good chance that there was some kind of eruption that took place there that literally took that whole area out. And uh, you have the Dead Sea there now. In any case, fire and brimstone come down and Lot asks um, to be delivered from the city of Sodom and go to a small city called Zoar. And the angel says, no, don't go to Zoar. Go up in the mountains, just get out. And Lot goes, please, please, it's just a small city. And, and the angel goes, fine, Zoar, Zoar is it. Go to Zoar. Does he end up going to Zoar? Yeah, for a little while. And then he ends up going, yeah, no. And he goes up into the mountains. Like God had told him to in the first place. Well, when he gets up into the mountains, he's in a cave. And he's in a cave with the two daughters that went with him, who he thought were virgins, and they get this plan, and apparently, I don't know, I don't know what was in their head, but apparently they, they thought that, you know, basically the whole world was being destroyed and they had to repopulate the earth. And so they said, let's do this. Let's get our dad drunk and you sleep with him the first night and I'll sleep with him the next night. And they both did that and they got pregnant and that's where 
the, the people of Ammon and the people of Moab came from. They're the descendants of Lot um, from his daughters, which is all kinds of messed up. And again, these people are related to the people of Israel. Abraham, um, Lot was Abraham's nephew. And so, again, you have these relations who were taking the people of God and just ravaging them. It says in verse 13 that they ripped open women to extend their borders, literally. Um, you know, you, you read about this um, uh, not often in the Bible, but off and on, where these armies will come in, and if you have a pregnant lady, they'll go up, and obviously they're using swords and knives. If you have a pregnant lady, they'll walk up to them, and they'll just stab them in the belly and cut the baby out. And the reason that they do that is to terrorize the population. It's also to get rid of the next generation. Um, can you imagine your wife, your daughter, your sister is pregnant and some just evil man comes in and does something like that. And again, these people are supposed to be related. And so God sees that whole thing. And again, it's designed to decimate and to terrorize a population. God sees that whole thing and God goes, okay, you know, it's like you came in and you ripped open the women with child in Gilead and it really happened, right? So bad things happen to people in Gilead, women in Gilead. And they went through it, and they died because of it. So they died, and their children died because of it, and God did nothing to stop it. But he is going to avenge it. And it's one of those things, again, that you've got to keep in mind when you're going through your Bible. The Bible doesn't promise me that bad things are never going to happen to me or happen to my friends or happen to my family. What the Bible promises me is that God's got it in control. If I have to go through something like that, God's going to watch out for me and he's going to give me the strength to get through it. And sometimes he'll protect me. And if it's time for me to go, he won't. You see that in Paul's life, for example. So Paul the apostle, God's using him. And there are multiple times when Paul should have been dead. The guy was shipwrecked three times, at least twice. He was floating around in the ocean for um, over a day and a night is what he says in one passage. So he's, you know what, I, I'm a scuba diver. And when, when you go scuba diving, you know, I used, to, I used to snorkel. And snorkeling is kind of cool because you're up on top of the water and you're looking down and stuff like that. But scuba diving is cooler because you actually have a little bit more control. You can go where you want to, right? You got the tanks on your back, you're breathing air and that kind of stuff. You can go where you want to. You know what a guy floating around on the top of the water is? Yeah, he's food. That's food. You're, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You are, you are in the, uh, what, do you, what do you call that? Um, yeah, the food chain. You're in the food chain. And so sharks, many sharks attack from the bottom and stuff. Um, you know, it's like I, I think about that um, sometimes. You know, I still snorkel and stuff. And I'm just watching when I'm snorkeling to see, you know, what's underneath me and, and that kind of stuff to make sure that I'm not food. Even for little fishies. I don't want to be food for them. I don't want something to bite me and stuff. Can you imagine being out in the middle of the ocean in the dead of night? You know how dark it gets without lights? In the dead of night, you're floating in the middle of the ocean. You have no idea what's underneath you. And that's what Paul the Apostle is doing. Obviously, he was not going to be part of the food chain. God protected him. And you see that in, in a number of instances in his life up until the end of his life when the Romans took out on the on the um, Appian Way, took him out on the Appian Way, and they cut his head off. And then he was dead. And where did he go? Yeah, he went home to be with the Lord. But up until that time, the dude's Superman. You can't do anything to him. Snakes bite him, doesn't hurt him. Shakes him off into the fire. You know, that kind of stuff. The guy's Superman up until the point where he's done. But then when he's done, God takes him home. And so... Again, I am not guaranteed this perfect life. I am guaranteed that God will be with me in the trials that I go through. And so there are times when bad things happen to people and bad things happen to these women. Some of the worst things that you can think of happen to these women. And God allowed it to happen. But God avenges. And he comes through and he takes care of it. Um, hopefully those women knew the Lord and went home to be with him but God always avenges. And so God goes, you ripped open the women of Israel, of Gilead, 
and I'm going to burn you. There's going to be battle, there's going to be war cries, there's going to be a mighty wind, and there's going to be captivity. And that was fulfilled in 734 by the Assyrians. Get to chapter 2, and it says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. But I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kiriath. Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting and trumpet sound, and I will cut off the judge from its midst and slay all its princes with him, says the Lord. And so you have Moab burning the bones of Edom's king. You know, uh, in the Old Testament, um, defilement of graves, graves, grave robbery, that kind of stuff, it was just a heinous crime. And so Moab sets fire to the bodies of the Edomite royalty and burns them to lime, and it was something that wasn't to be done. In fact, you know, it's like we look at that and... You know, that's, that's just cremation to us, right? And so when you, when you go, when you die, uh, or when a family member dies, you have a choice of burial usually or cremation. I don't, I don't know if you have any other choices. You know, I don't know, freeze them, whatever, okay. Freezing, burial, cremation, those are your choices. In any case, um, you know, people will ask me at times uh, whether or not, whether cremation is okay with God. And in this instance, it wasn't. And the reason that it wasn't is, is because it was a curse on the people of Edom. It was, it was something that was dishonoring and disrespectful to the royalty of Edom. Basically what they were doing is they were taking away any monumental tomb that they could have. So basically they're taking the Edomite royalty and just treating them like trash, literally. Something that you would burn out in the, out in the dump someplace. And again, God sees that. So does that mean that we shouldn't get, be cremated um, when we die? You know, um, if you're cremating somebody because you want to treat them like they're trash, then that applies to you. But if you're cremating somebody because you can't afford a $10,000 burial, then that doesn't apply to you. You know, um, the way that people buried their dead back in those days was, by, was, was usually by putting them into a cave and rolling a rock in front of it. And then after a year, they'd come back and gather up the bones and put them in what was called an ossuary, a little, basically a little chest, and then they would go and bury that chest, again, usually in the, in the same cave. And then the next body would be put on the, on the uh, slab that was in there. And so they did this in tombs back in those days. But there are, there are caves all over the land of Israel. And, um, you know, up until the 1800s, basically, uh, probably the early 1900s, you could bury somebody in your backyard. And so, you know, that's what I would like to do. I've got four acres. I'm thinking about, you know, you know, when one of my horses die, uh, dies, I just go out and dig a hole. It's a big hole. <laughs> but I've had to bury two horses. Go out and dig a hole, throw some lime on them, you know, put them six feet down and cover them up, you know. It's all legal, and when it comes to horses, you can do that, but when it comes to people, you can't. I kind of think that's messed up. I think, I think my wife should be able to bury me in the backyard, you know? And if that was the case, then it's the cost of a bag of lime, basically, and digging the hole. And she could get one of you guys to dig the hole, you know? <laughs> so it's a pretty cheap burial, and that's the, diff that's the difference between what, what you have in Bible days and what you have Nowadays, you know, I don't care how I die, how I, how, what happens with my body after I die. You know, the Bible talks about the fact that God's going to be able to, he's going to come back and he's going to raise my body from the dead. And it doesn't matter if it's rotten in a grave someplace or if the ashes got spread all over, you know, all over the ocean. You know, that's what I, that's what I want. I, I want to be cremated and I want my wife to go out and blow my ashes. I don't want her to throw the ashes, I want her to blow them. out over the ocean someplace. You know? And so you have this down on tape, and so you all know my last wishes, right? So you're all going to make Bobby do that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure you are. <laughs> you lied. You bore false witness. In any case, you know, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if I'm in a grave or if, you know, if my ashes have been spread around. God knows where the parts are. And he can put the whole thing together and nothing's going to stop him. You know, what happens in cremation is you just speed up the process. And when you bury somebody, 
they rot away, they become dust like the Bible says. And uh, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, as it's said in the little poem. And uh, um, God can take care of that whole thing. In any case, when the Moabites did this, though, what they were doing was they were dishonoring the people of Edom. And again, Edom is family to Moab. Okay? And they're doing this stuff. And so God goes. Moab's, Moab's going to die in tumult. So God judges many times, even on behalf of the wicked, because they're still made in the image of God. And all the way through this, what you see with these different nations is that God is looking at these, these nations or these city-states, and he's saying, you violated my covenant, the covenant that I have with you, which again is a Noahic covenant. You're not to treat man like he's something less than what he is. What man is, is made in God's image. And I'm speaking in the um, generic here. And so we as men and women are made in the image of God and we're to be treated accordingly. And you don't get to do the stuff that these guys have done without getting the judgment of God. And so God doesn't just judge for Christians, he'll judge for non-believers too. And he sees the events that takes, take place on this earth and he takes care of things. And sometimes he doesn't do it as quickly as we would like him to, but he does take care of them. And so again, what happened with Moab was the Assyrians came in and conquered these guys and wiped them out. And so again, you have that whole thing. Um, and we'll just stop right there because I want to do communion. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 11. And, you know, um, this is usually the passage that, that I go to when we're going to do communion. And obviously it's because of the, the whole thing here with Jesus' body and, and, and his blood and the cup and the, and the bread and all of that stuff. But the context of this passage is unrighteous treatment of some Christians towards other Christians. And just real quick, let's go, let's go through and, and look at it. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. it says, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, which means separations, divisions, that kind of thing. There must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. You know, sometimes when there's splits and factions and fights and stuff like that, the reason that God allows them is so that you can see who the good guys are. And so you can see who the bad guys are. And so you can see whether or not you really got friends. That kind of thing. And God brings stuff out to the forefront. And that's what he's talking about here. And he says, um, therefore, when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. And what he's talking about was at the end of a church service, they would have the Lord's Supper, which included a potluck, basically. And so many times you had Christians there who were so poor that the only good meal that they had all week long was literally at the church. And uh, a lot of these guys were slaves. And so they come to church and they have nothing to bring. And so the free believers are bringing most of the food. And you know how that gets. You go to the potluck, you're bringing all this food for you and your family and for maybe, you know, you fix enough for another family or two and stuff like that. And then you get through the line and you know, you, you're a little bit late and there's nothing left for you and your family. And you do that at a couple of potlucks and it starts to get old, right? You know, um, actually, usually when I'm at a, at a potluck, I just wait until the end, you know, um, because, you know, it's just, you, you, want, you want people to, you just don't want to be in front, right? Except for one time. <laughs> do you guys know what happened to me? Was that the India dinner? That, yeah, it was the India dinner. So we're having the India dinner, right? And so my rule is I come in after, you know, I go, I go up and get something to eat after everybody else has eaten. That's, that's always been the rule. It's how I always do it. And so my secretary tells me, okay, India dinner's starting at six. And, uh, you know, I, and I know she told me the right thing. She, she probably told me it starts at six. They're going to be eating at 630. 
But what I got in my head, because I'm so busy, is it starts at 6, and so I figure everybody's going to be eating at 6. So I'm in my office doing stuff, and, and Bobby couldn't come because she wasn't feeling good. And so I decide, well, I'm just going to wait a while, and I'll wait till about 6.20, 6.25. And so it comes along 6.20, and I come walking in, and you know I pay my money because I want to support those guys and stuff. And so I go up and get something to eat. Guess what? Everybody else is sitting at the table. <laughs> They literally haven't taken the trays off the, or the lids off the trays and stuff. And so I go walking up to get something to eat. And uh, Rob comes in and he, and he, go, and he you know, takes the tray off for me. And I go, oh, this looks really good and stuff. And so I'm just sitting there, you know, just piling stuff on my plate. I'm like, wow, there's food. This is awesome. You know, I always, you know it's like I'm always getting the dregs here. This is really great and stuff. And I turn around and nobody else is eating. And I'm like, what's up, Rob? Are they supposed to be eating? He goes, well, yeah, I think they're supposed to be eating. I go, why aren't you guys eating? And so then I, you know, I, I finish this all up and I go sit down. And then um, Zach comes up and he comes up to pray for the meal <laughs> afterwards. And so there's the pastor. He comes walking up, goes and gets his food first. Goes over and sits down. I was so embarrassed. I could not believe it. In any case, that's what these guys were doing. They were going and making sure that they got fed before anybody else did. And some of the people who were the least in the church in the sense of monetarily were not getting. Actually, they were just being left out. And you can imagine. Um, how, I, don't, I don't know. I've, I've seen some Christians do some pretty awful things at times. And I can, I can imagine, if Paul has to say this to these guys, I can imagine how that was going. You know, you, can, you could see some Christians standing there with their family and going in and getting the food. And somebody who's poor comes up and they go, well, did you bring something? Well, no, you know, well, maybe you should be polite and stay in the back of the line while people who actually brought something get something to eat. And you can just kind of wait your turn. Can you see somebody saying that? Yeah, absolutely. Is that wicked? Yeah, that's wicked. And that's apparently the stuff that was going on. And so... Paul goes on and he says, um, what, do you not have houses to eat and drink in or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this, this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Basically what Paul's saying is, don't you know what you're doing when you're celebrating the Lord's Supper? And they would always end it with communion. Don't you know what you're doing? You're talking about the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus gave. He's the only one who actually has anything to give, and he gave it to us so that we could freely come, and then you dishonor people. He goes, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And I think when he says not discerning the Lord's body there, he's talking about the fact that the body of Christ is all these people who are here and you're sitting there dishonoring a man or dishonoring a woman because they don't have anything, and you don't even recognize what the body of Christ is all about, that you can do that kind of stuff. And so he says, when you eat that, in that kind of context, you're eating and drinking judgment to yourself. And he goes on and says, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Does God make Christians sick? Does God kill them? And the reason, again, is because of the way that they're treating each other. Shouldn't do that. Then he says, verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And he goes on with the rest of it. So see that context? So even in the midst of the church, God is watching stuff. And he watches how we treat people. He watches, how we, how, he watches our attitudes and stuff like that. That's why when I get attitudes, 
I'm always doing an attitude check in my head because I've read passages like this and I don't want to be the guy who's homesick because I've got a bad attitude towards somebody and that kind of thing. And so, you know, again, God's like a, he's like a, he's like a good dad. And every once in a while, you know, there are people who need to pop up the backside of the head because they're out of line and stuff. And that's good, right? But if I would judge myself, I wouldn't have to get those things. And so it's one of those things that the Bible commands. So just kind of tying that together, you know, it's like, it's like if, you're, if, you're, if you're treating other people in a rotten way, you know, like just exactly the same way that you did when you were in the world and you're coming into the body of Christ and you're doing the same things with people, God sees it and it's not to be done. It's not the way that things are supposed to go. And so we need to keep that stuff in mind. So when we partake of communion, we need to do it with a, with a right heart. Um, Jesus loves you. That's why he died for you. And Jesus loves the person next to you. And that's why he died for them. And Jesus loves the person across the church from you that you won't sit next to anymore because they ticked you off. Right? And he sees all that. And we're the body of Christ. And so lots of people like to talk about the body of Christ as being a family. Um, there are some family dynamics that don't belong here. <laughs> It's a family in the good sense. <laughs> you know, we need to be treating each other like family in the good sense. So you're my brother, you're my sister, I'm your brother, and you're stuck with me. You know, you can pick your friends, you can't pick your family. Here I am. I'm your brother. You're stuck. And I'm stuck with you, too. It's good to be stuck. So let's, uh, we'll, we'll sing, and uh, I'll pray, and, and uh, you guys can come up and take it when you're ready. Like, you know, like we always do on Wednesdays, so... Jesus, thank you so much um, for, for the sacrifice that you made for us. Paul said in that, in that passage that um, you said um, that this is your body which was broken for us and that every time that we do this, we're to do it in remembrance of you. And so, Lord, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the beating that you took. We thank you for the fact that you deserved none of it. You were slandered and you were... Um, lied about and you were beaten and it was for no good reason it was all unrighteous and yet you took it and you took it because you were taking my place and you were taking the place of these people here and Lord we thank you that um, you're a God who doesn't just sit off in heaven someplace making commands uh, but you came down and you, you took a punishment upon you that you never ever deserved so that we could get heaven, which we've never, ever deserved. And Lord, we just thank you for it. God, we thank you for pure hearts, too. Thank you for the fact that um, even though our hearts can, can be defiled and dirty, and, and uh, you talk about the wickedness of the human heart at times, and uh, how awful it can be, um, that you come along, and you take it, and you cleanse it, and you make it as white as snow. And you don't do that with our good works. You do that with the, um, the blood of Jesus and uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we thank you for your blood, too. Thank you that you would shed your blood for us as a, like the Bible says, a propitiation, a payment, so that we could have the relationship with you that we've got. And again, we just love you for it. And, Lord, as we partake of these elements, we remember you.